Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Evening Bible Study. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians. Or if you have our study material, our workbook, it begins on page 78. This week's reading has been in the book of Ephesians. There are six chapters in Ephesians, and what we have tried to do thus far in our going through the several weeks of the writings of the Apostle Paul and then adding the book of Hebrews on the end of that, our goal has been to read somewhere between four and six chapters a week and to look for highlights in each of those chapters to be able to discuss and compare notes of what stood out to me in the chapters is similar to what stood out to you in each of these chapters. But when we come to the book of Ephesians, we're going to make a little bit of an adjustment again. And we're only going to take the first three chapters tonight in the book of Ephesians, and then we'll take chapters four, five, and six next week. So if you get your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, or in your workbooks to page 78, we'll start right after we consider that question, what's God done in your life this past week that's been a blessing to you that you could share with someone? And I guess it's kind of a regular thing that I realized was a blessing for me personally this past week. A week prior to this last Sunday, we had a guest speaker in our church in the morning and in the evening. And so it was one of those rare occasions when I was here, but I wasn't in the pulpit speaking or teaching. And so that's only happened a couple or three times in the four years that I've been here as the pastor. And it's a little bit of an awkward feeling. This past Sunday, it was just me. And so I was in the pulpit on Sunday morning and then again on Sunday evening. And we had our regular Sunday afternoon chronological Bible study here at the church. And so getting back into the regular routine and being able to preach and to teach uh, was a blessing to me. Uh, I don't quite feel right when I'm here and I'm not the one that's up there speaking. And so uh, it was nice to get back uh, to the routine things, I guess. So it's, again, the little things in life that seem to bring us great joy from time to time. Well, you can see that the surroundings are a little different for this video. I'm in a different room here at the church, trying to find a place where the, the uh, reflection of the lights on the whiteboard are not so bad. So I'm across the hall from where I normally do our Wednesday evening Bible study videos. And I have up here on the whiteboard a timeline. And we will refer to that some as we go through these first three chapters in the book of Ephesians. And if you'll notice, uh, over on the far left, if you can read that, it says Adam and then Abraham. What I have here are three groups of people. We'll eventually get to a fourth group. But there are from the time of Adam up until the time that you and I are living now, the Apostle Paul identifies three groups of people. First, there are Gentiles from a, from Adam to Abraham, everybody on planet Earth was a Gentile because there were no Jews yet. Beginning with Abraham going on, there were both Gentiles on this top timeline, and then there were also Jews on this green line there in the middle. When you come to the cross, and after the Lord's ascension, and went back to heaven and the day of Pentecost came and the New Testament church was uh, begun, then we have the church. So in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul identified three people groups, the Gentiles, the Jews, and the church. This big arrow that goes up here represents the time when the Lord comes to receive the church as his bride to take her back to heaven with him prior to this tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. But there will be a tremendous number of people that turn to Christ in faith during this period of time. 
And instead of being identified as the church, since the church will already have gone up to heaven, they will be referred to as tribulation saints. And that will take place during Daniel's 70th week. That's a seven year period. So in my timeline here, I don't have it quite drawn to scale. There's 2000 years from Adam to Abraham. There are 2000 more years from Abraham to the cross. There are thus far almost 2000 years from the cross until the time which you, are, you and I are living. And then this period here that looks almost the size of these other periods only lasts for seven years, plus maybe a brief window of time between the rapture of the church and when the tribulation period actually starts. This big red arrow that comes down is when the Lord comes back to planet Earth to set up his kingdom. And then this kingdom age right here is a 1,000 year period so we've got 2,000 years plus 2,000 more years plus 2,000 more years in here, just about, and these seven years plus the 1,000 years of the kingdom fall in line with that 7,000 year plan for mankind that is somewhat symbolic of the seven day week and also the seven year sabbatical year. And in the seven day week, there are six days of labor and one day of rest. In the sabbatical years or the Shemitah years uh, in the Old Testament under the Mosaic law, there were six years of to uh, tilling the soil and planting and harvesting. And then one year, the soil was to be left fallow and not planted or harvested. And then that would be one day or one year of rest. And so that's the picture, seven days in a week, seven years in a Shemitah cycle, and then 7,000 years in uh, prophetically speaking of man's history prior to eternity when we get beyond the kingdom. And that's if I've interpreted uh, prophecy and the Bible correctly. And there are people that, of course, disagree with that particular time frame and timetable. But that's the way I look at it, dispensationally speaking. So I have that back there because we will refer to that from time to time in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is a very good example of the books that Paul wrote in that the first portion is dedicated to doctrine or teaching or theology. And the first three chapters of the six chapters of the book of Ephesians are doctrinal teaching. They teach us our position in Christ. It's theology. The last three chapters, chapters four, five, and six, are chapters of practical application that Paul would have us to then apply the scriptural principles that he teaches us in the first three chapters to our lives. And that will be easier to understand next week when we get to there. This will be a bit of a review uh, for some of you in that some of you have gone through our Wednesday evening Bible study a few months ago when we looked at the prison epistles from the Apostle Paul and Ephesians is oftentimes the first one of his prison epistles that people look at. And that's the way it was for us when we studied the prison epistles. But we also went through the book of Ephesians in a much longer and drawn out and deeper look at some of the verses in our Sunday morning services several weeks ago as well. So this is somewhat of a review to many of you. So with that background, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Paul starts off, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And beginning at verse number three, he's going to give us a bunch of scriptural principles that are doctrinal theological teaching that describe our position in Christ and in the world. 
He says in verse three, remember that he's writing this to believers in the church in Ephesus. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Notice in Christ or in him or in the beloved or in the Lord himself is a, one of Paul's favorite phrases, in Christ. That's another way of saying that you're born again or you have been saved or you are a Christ follower. So we consider ourselves positionally in Christ. A lot of times we teach our kiddos that when they trust in Jesus as their savior, that Jesus lives within their heart. And we've talked about this many times before. Technically, it's the Holy Spirit who dwells within our heart. And we find that from Paul's teaching in many of his writings. And the Lord himself uh, taught that to his apostles in the upper room the night that he was betrayed. And so we picture ourselves being in Christ. And we're going to find that phrase almost, or one of those phrases similar to that, almost 20 times in the first three chapters. There are, I think, 66 verses in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And we're going to find this phrase, in Christ or in Him or in the Lord Himself or in Jesus Christ, 20 times. So almost one out of every three verses is going to have this phrase attached to it. So it's a big deal with Paul. And he says, blessed is everyone, or God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We receive spiritual blessings and promises of them. These Jews right here, the promises that they received from the Old Testament prophecies were for a, uh, a physical kingdom with the Messiah ruling and reigning from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And that's what will happen over here when the Lord comes back to set up his kingdom. But you and I, as members of the New Testament church, are primarily promised spiritual blessings. Now, we'll take part in the kingdom also, and I'm sure that the Lord will have some type of productive job or responsibility for us to accomplish. We don't know exactly what that is, but we'll find out one of these days. And so we want to make a distinction, especially when we study the Bible dispensationally, that there is a difference in God's plan for the New Testament church and the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. He will never be through with either one of those groups and one has not replaced the other. He has a specific design, plan, and purpose for each. And we will be a part of that plan. But right now we're thinking that Paul is teaching us that we have been given a promise of all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, not just on earth, but in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse number four says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we get into the idea of being chosen or election or predestination in this book and in these chapters. And we should not let that bother us. We should not let that bother us any more that any more than man's free will seems to bother some people. And we're familiar with the uh, back and forth confrontation between uh, Calvinism and Arminianism. One to the nth degree has God's sovereignty and the other one to the nth degree has man's free will. What Paul teaches is both of those things. Paul teaches that God is sovereign and that he has chosen us from before the foundation of the world. He also teaches us that it's our responsibility to trust in Christ and make a decision to trust in him and believe in him as our Lord and Savior and to follow him in obedience. So Paul teaches both predestination and man's free will and responsibility. It's kind of like explaining the Trinity. We kind of have an idea what it is, but we're really taxed to try to be able to explain it to somebody's understanding if they don't already know something about it. 
So he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. And verse five says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. And he says, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So there's that phrase in Christ, in the beloved. Verse seven even starts off with that phrase, in him. We have redemption through his blood. Remember that the writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We'll eventually get to that one of these days when we get to the book of Hebrews after we go all through all of Paul's writings. So Paul says here that in verse number 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. There's in Christ again, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. We've talked before several times about three places in the universe that we can find mankind in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. In heaven would be people who have gone on already to be with Christ. On earth would be you and me. Under the earth would be those who did not trust in Christ and are now in torments, such as the story that Jesus gave about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was taken into the paradise side of Sheol. The rich man was taken to the torment side of Sheol. I believe that when Jesus ascended after uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, he emptied out the paradise side of Sheol and took them with him. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us now, in our day and time, as soon as a believer dies, he goes immediately to be in the presence of the Lord. So he's going to speak about a mystery. He said in verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So in heaven and on earth are believers. And we have been reconciled and united together with him through his shed blood. The next thing that I notice that Paul teaches us in this first chapter of Ephesians is that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, he said, in him, there's that phrase again, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, there's a form of that phrase again, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul teaches that once we trust in Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit baptizes us or identifies us into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. And he also comes to dwell within us and it becomes our seal of redemption, seal or our promise, our guarantee of our salvation. The latter portion of chapter 1 of Ephesians is a tremendous prayer that Paul gave. He said, Therefore, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you always in my prayers. And then he goes on to tell them the things that he prays for them. And it included that uh, they would uh, have the spirit of wisdom and knowledge of God, that their eyes of understanding would be enlightened, that they would know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. And so the things that he prayed for them also can be directed towards you and me. We move to chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians, and there's again a ton of things here that are precious to you and me and speak about our position in Christ. And it starts off with him reminding us that prior to Christ, we were Gentiles in the world outside of the covenants of Israel and the promises of the law and the word of God and were without God having no hope in the world. But now in 
Christ Jesus, we've been brought near to him. Verse 1 of chapter 2, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. The plan of God to save mankind is not to make us good people. The plan of God and salvation is to make people who are spiritually dead alive in Christ Jesus. You who were once dead in trespasses and sins, he has now made alive. You walked once according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse four begins with two tremendous words, but God. If you ever wanted to do a word study on a particular phrase in the Bible and have it be a real meaningful study for you, just put in a word search in a Bible search engine someplace, but God, and see the things that come back to you and follow them. One of the great ones is here in Ephesians chapter two and verse four. We were lost without God in the world having no hope, Verse four says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then he says, he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. So when Christ ascended into the heavens and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, when we are in Christ, Positionally, it's as if we are seated right there with him at the right hand of God. That almost sounds irreverent to think of that or say it, doesn't it? But that's what he says here. He's made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And verse 7 says about even the time beyond that, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We have no idea the riches of the kindness of the grace of God that he will show to us throughout all of eternity. And then a couple of very uh, famous verses that are well known by a lot of people. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So salvation is a gift. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. It's a gift. And once we have it, we can't lose it. If we're disobedient, we can be chastened, but we won't ever be unspiritually born once we have trusted in Christ. And then the last verse of this particular section of chapter two, verse number 10, is one that should get all of our attention. He said, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There's that phrase again four good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, we don't work and then get saved. We get saved and we trust in Christ. We become born again into his family. And from that point on through our life, we do good deeds in service for him. So he ordained from the beginning that we're, we were uh, created or are his workmanship in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So then he's going to give us a little bit of history lesson in verse 11 of chapter two of Ephesians. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, back over here, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that's just another way of saying the difference between Jew and Gentile. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, there's that phrase again, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Prior to the cross, Gentiles 
were separated from the Jews. And we were without God and outside the promises of the covenant, having no hope in the world. But now, in Christ, after the cross, we have been made alive together with them. And he's going to talk about the mystery. And the mystery that he brings out about the New Testament church in Ephesians is that both Jew and Gentile become one in Christ. So there are Gentiles, Jews, and then the church. Because friend, in the New Testament church, there's no more bond or slave, uh, male or female, Jew or Gentile. We're all one in Christ. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. In ancient days, when the temple was there, before it was destroyed, outside the temple proper was a huge courtyard area. And there were places in there where Gentiles could go, but there was a certain place they couldn't go beyond. There was a wall of separation that kept Gentiles away from where the Jews could go closer to the symbolic presence of the Lord that was in the Holy of Holies in the temple or in the tabernacle. But he's saying here, he has made both one and has broken down that middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two. That's why we recognize the church as a different person than either the Jews or the Gentiles. We come now to uh, verse 19. He says, therefore, you're no longer strangers or foreigners, but in fact, you're fellow citizens with the saints. In Philippians, Paul talks about that our citizenship is in heaven. We have dual citizenship, a little bit similar to what the Apostle Paul had. He was a Roman citizen. He was a Jewish citizen, but also he was a citizen of heaven. And you and I are citizens of wherever we live. We also have citizenship in heaven. It brings us to chapter 3, talking about this mystery being revealed. The mystery is the New Testament church and the body of Christ that makes up the church. The New Testament church is not this building that I'm in. The New Testament church is made up of individual people who are in that local congregation of the local church. And then the big C church, as sometimes we refer to it, would represent all the people that have trusted in Christ. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to be the mystery, as I briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. Prior to the cross and the day of Pentecost, the church was a mystery, the people in the Old Testament. But he says that which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by his spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And here comes his explanation of the mystery from Ephesians, verse 6 of chapter 3, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So Paul says in the next paragraph that one of his responsibilities in his ministry is to make people understand and to know the fellowship of this mystery. Both Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. No more male and female, no more rich or poor. We're all one in Christ. And so he ends up chapter 3 with another tremendous prayer. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. The inner man is that portion of us, our spirit, that's 
experienced the new birth, have been born again into the family of God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth of height, to know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. These first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are just loaded with spiritual principles that teach us theological principles and scriptural principles of our position in Christ and our being seated together with him in the heavenly places, positionally even at the right hand of God the Father. And that as part of the New Testament church and being in Christ, we are co-heirs together with Christ and we're fellow citizens with the saints, with the Jewish uh, believers as well. Next week, we'll begin looking at chapters four, five, and six and see the practical application that Paul encourages us to apply to our lives these principles that we've learned from chapters one, two, and three. There's no way that we can glean everything that there is to learn from this book of Ephesians in however amount of time that we take going through it. We could spend the rest of our lives studying this book and learn something new, I think, just about every time we go through it. It's a tremendous book, and I would encourage you to read it uh, many times. So next week, if you'd like to read ahead, chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Ephesians. Father, thank you for our time together today. Thank you for those who join us online. Thank you for the riches of your word. Help us that we might draw close to you and understand by your Holy Spirit's blessing us with wisdom and understanding from your word. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Until we see, uh, see you again, either Saturday or uh, maybe tomorrow morning in Thursday Bible Life today, or Saturday afternoon in our weekly recap, or maybe next week at Wednesday evening Bible study, whenever we see you again. Until then, Lord bless you.